My name is Peter Netland. I'm at the University of Virginia in the United States, uh, and I'm very grateful to be with you today on this uh, broadcast. I'm very sorry that I can't be there in person, uh, and I look forward to that very much in the future. Uh, I'm very grateful to uh, the um, to the moderators, uh, Dr. Governova. I'm also grateful to Dr. Pozdaeva for the invitation uh, and the coordination. Uh, of course, we're grateful to the sponsors, uh, Vision Technology, and uh, the Association of Ophthalmologists in Russia, the Central um, Medical Military Bureau, and, and of course, uh, most importantly, the Russian Glaucoma Society. Uh, congratulations to you on this uh, great meeting. Um, so today I'll be talking about aniridian glaucoma. Uh, this is a, um, a problem that we encounter on occasion in a glaucoma practice, uh, but it's important to know how to manage it skillfully. The disease aniridia is due to a Pax6 mutation, the Pax6 gene, uh, and it causes multiple ocular abnormalities uh, and even systemic problems as well. Um, the glaucoma is a progressive problem that can occur during the lifetime of the patient and is potentially vision threatening and therefore important to us. Um, it's common in aniridia. In, in uh, the literature, it occurs in up to 75% of patients over time. Uh, any age can be affected, but uh, it occurs most frequently in childhood. So for this reason, it's also important to us. Uh, the treatments that we use are effective. In managing these patients, we often have to keep in mind that we have to manage other problems that are associated with uh, this disease as well. So uh, aniridic glaucoma has multiple mechanisms that cause it. Uh, infantile glaucoma is very uncommon. When it does occur, it's oftentimes due to irido-trabecular dysgenesis. Uh, absence of Schlem's canal has been reported, but this is very rare. Most commonly, this problem occurs during childhood and early adulthood. It's usually due to an open angle glaucoma. It can also be due to a chronic progressive angle closure glaucoma, but this is uncommon in our experience. Um, of course, we can see secondary angle, angle closure glaucoma after surgery, uh, but also this is relatively uncommon. So usually it's an open angle glaucoma occurring in childhood. This is a case, though, to illustrate the infantile form of the glaucoma. Uh, it can be very difficult to control and manage. Uh, it has its onset shortly after birth or even at birth. Uh, and I've always wondered whether this might uh, predict an earlier onset of other problems as well, including aneuritic keratopathy. This is one of my patients I've followed for nearly 20 years who had the appearance of uh, aneuritic glaucoma shortly after birth, it had a markedly elevated intraocular pressure, especially in the left eye, and was treated with several glaucoma procedures, ultimately controlling her intraocular pressure. Uh, but 17 years later, you see in the photograph below that she does have a severe keratopathy and has had multiple corneal procedures uh, and still has had reduced vision due to the corneal problems that occur later. So it's something I've always often wondered about, uh, but uh, even for the infantile form of the glaucoma, we can manage the pressures usually. So there are many ocular abnormalities that occur. Glaucoma is, re glaucoma is relatively common. It occurs in this series, which was a series that we published several years ago, in about half the patients, but oftentimes it's reported at a higher rate over the lifetime of a group of individuals. This figure shows the, the age of diagnosis for glaucoma and aniridia, and you can see that the rate increases over the lifetime of the patients in this series of patients. Uh, and this was again from a paper we published a couple years ago, uh, where we end up with about nearly 50% of the patients who have glaucoma over time. And the median age for glaucoma in this group was 8.5 years. So uh, most, uh, half the children have developed glaucoma by the time that they're about eight and a half. So uh, this is important to keep in mind as we're monitoring the patients. Most of the patients that do develop glaucoma are treated with glaucoma medications, and very frequently they're treated with surgery. In fact, the majority of patients do require surgical treatment at some point during their life. Point during their life. The gold standard still for measuring the intraocular pressure in the United States is tonometry, uh, but we've found the rebound tonometer very useful in clinic. This is an image of the rebound tonometer in your upper right. The rebound tonometer has uh, allowed us to measure the intraocular pressure in children very easily in clinic, and this reduces the need for EU uh, examinations under anesthesia. Um, nonetheless, the results that we do get with any method can be influenced by corneal thickness. It turns out that increased central corneal thickness is common in aniridia. Uh, the measurements that have been published are quite high, and this is sometimes a factor in interpreting the results in these patients. So here's a, a patient of mine that was an 11-year-old girl that had aniridia and glaucoma. 
Uh, she failed medical therapy, had increased intraocular pressures despite that. So uh, at this point in her management, she had an intraocular pressure in the mid to high 20s in the right eye and about 20 in the left eye. So her central corneal thickness measurements were 680 in the right and 661 in the left. Uh, she had an early keratopathy and she had fundus, uh, on her fundus exam she had fulval hypoplasia, which is common in aniridia. But the question came up, is, is, uh, is this a safe intraocular pressure for, um, for, the, uh, for this patient? Or is the corneal thickness something that we have to take into account? Well, this patient was monitored for a while and even though the central corneal thickness was above normal, the intraocular pressure turned out to be high for the disc with cupping in the right eye that developed. And you can see here from the OCT in the, in the middle panel that there's marked uh, thinning of the uh, retinal nerve fiber layer um, in the right eye and also in the visual field, advanced visual field loss. So this patient was then treated with surgery in the right eye which normalized her intraocular pressure and she stabilized after that. So we, we can oftentimes now do complete examinations in the clinic without anesthesia. Uh, we found the rebound tonometer to be useful in this regard in avoiding examinations under anesthesia. Uh, sometimes it is difficult to get the information though and we do, uh, we do uh, have to do examinations under anesthesia. In the old days we used to do more, use more sedatives in the clinic, chloral hydrate and other uh, sedatives, uh, but now this is impractical for us in a clinical setting. Uh, so we more commonly go directly to EUA if we need to in these patients. And that's now fortunately fairly infrequent. So uh, in terms of the, um, the examinations and monitoring the patients, we do try to see the patients every six months or so because of the risk of developing elevated intraocular pressure at any time during childhood. Um, if the patient does develop glaucoma, of course, we may have to see them more frequently. And, uh, and it's important to keep in mind for the parents just to remind them that glaucoma can occur anytime, even if an initial examination shows no glaucoma, they still may develop a secondary glaucoma later. In terms of assessing the anterior chamber angle, we do perform uh, gonioscopy still, and many times we can see the angle clearly. Uh, but if we can't, now we have anterior segment OCT, which does help us a lot with this. Uh, you can see on the panel on the right and down below, uh, there's a patient shown here who has actually, an, this is an aniridia patient that has an artificial iris implanted, so uh, on the lower panels, and so that's not an actual iris, that's a plastic iris. Uh, but in this uh, patient, you can see there's an open angle that we can see, on, we can appreciate on the uh, Visante OCT. So this has been helpful to us uh, and it helps us to analyze the angle in these patients. So when patients do have significant medial opacity, usually aneritic ker keratopathy in this group, we can still see the angle. Uh, and this is very useful in some instances. This is a patient who had a, a keratoprosthesis, very difficult to see the angle, very difficult to appreciate the details of the angle um, anatomy. And here we can actually visualize it and see that this patient has significant aniridia fibrosis syndrome, which has uh, caused um, significant fibrosis behind the optic of the K-pro, but also in the angle um, contributing to their secondary glaucoma. We found the OCT to be very useful for nerve fiber layer analysis and following these patients. And of course, with the increased resolution of OCT, now we have the, obviously the Cirrus for the Zeiss and also the Spectralis. Uh, these have been very useful machines in terms of measuring the uh, nerve fiber layer and this has been helpful in monitoring these patients. Uh, we're looking for areas of, uh, that are progressing and when we see that, we obviously try to increase our uh, aggressiveness of our treatment of glaucoma. Now when we do treat the patients, we have medical therapy. Uh, laser treatments in general are not very useful, um, but we can also do various kinds of incisional surgery in these uh, patients. There's a variety of surger surgeries that have been performed. I've listed some of them here, goniotomy, um, both prophylactic and therapeutic, uh, trabeculotomy, trabeculotomy and trabeculectomy combination, um, trabeculectomy with mitomycin C, uh, glaucoma drainage implants, cyclodestructive procedures, and a variety of other procedures that have been introduced more recently. Now, this is a, a long list, and it turns out that we um, use many of these fairly infrequently, but it can be useful for certain individual patients uh, to uh, treat their specific problems. And it's useful to know some of these, uh, some of the variety of procedures so that you have a good range of techniques you can use. Um, now, most commonly, however, we do use glaucoma drainage implants. For me, it's an glaucoma valve usually. The uh, indication for this is that the patients uh, oftentimes do fail conventional glaucoma surgery. Uh, they oftentimes have uh, the keratopathy and, and uh, extensive limbal scarring, and uh, failure of conventional surgery is likely, so we do, we do use drainage implants very commonly. 
Now after keratoprosthesis, which is becoming a very commonly used technique to treat the keratopathy, uh, patients can develop a severe secondary glaucoma and for this drainage implants are also useful. This is from an old paper, paper that still is, uh, has uh, information that's useful today. Uh, we were able to control the, p the pressure in the majority of patients uh, with a drainage implant after a keratoprosthesis. Uh, so this is the preferred technique usually with these patients who have keratoprosthesis. Uh, Enteridial fi fibrosis syndrome is an issue that we do have to deal with. Uh, we do try to minimize surgery to the extent we can. Because aniridia is a pro-fibrotic syndrome, we can see um, some severe fibro intraocular fibrosis after surgeries, and so we try to limit them to the deg degree that we can. Um, and it's actually really unknown at this point how much impact this problem has on the, our procedures that we do perform, but we suspect that it does have some impact on the, on the response to various treatments like drainage implant surgery in, with the capsule formation around the implants and, and issues like that. So this is an important problem. Much more is being found out about it. It's uh, occurring at about uh, nearly 10% of patients with aniridia who have surgery, uh, and it's something that we do watch out for. We also have a lot of new procedures. We have this conventional procedures, the uh, trabeculectomy and express implant, and then we have a variety of other new procedures, non-penetrating surgery, canaloplasties, trabectome, uh, eye stent and its vari variations that we now have, um, supracoidal shunting techniques, Solex Gold shunt, Cypass, and other techniques that we use. And essentially these are, um, since we're trying to, we have a secondary glaucoma, the situation is actually very frequently much like the, the, uh, the, the, fi the figure of the fundus on your right, where our goal is to try to get the pressure into the mid to high teens. So many of these new, with, and there's not so much disc damage in these secondary glaucomas. So these new procedures are of great interest to us. We are doing trabectome, we're doing some Solex Gold shunts in these patients, uh, especially if they've failed uh, drainage implant surgery, and these are useful approaches that we are now exploring in these patients and may uh, have a niche in the future in our armamentarium. So in conclusion, glaucoma is oftentimes associated with aniridia. Patients do frequently require surgical treatment and of course, close monitoring of these patients is important to avoid vision-threatening complications. I wanted to thank uh, Aniridia Foundation International, which is a group that's based here at UVA and supports many of these patients. Also, Aniridia Europe and Aniridia Russia, which are very important patient support groups that we've worked in the, with in the past. Uh, we're also grateful to the Sharon Stewart Foundation that has provided us with support here at UVA. And of course, I'm, I'm most grateful to the Russian Glaucoma Society for inviting me to this uh, meeting, and I look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you.